the 2017 Vancouver Natural Resource Symposium. This is Albert Liu with Sprott US Media, and I'm very pleased to be joined right now uh, by John Borshoff. He is the Managing Director and CEO of Deep Yellow Limited. John, thank you very much for joining me. How are you? Very well, Albert. Thank you for inviting me here to this uh, interview. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here and also at the conference as an exhibitor. Uh, John, I attended a lunch presentation today and uh, it, was, it was a very interesting presentation, but I want to backtrack a little bit to one of the first conversations we had, which was a couple months ago, I think, mm. over the phone. And uh, you introduced yourself and you said, uh, you know, I helped some people there at Sprott make a little bit of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Slight understatement. Yeah. Uh, you uh, were the founder of Paladin Energy and it's a story that I don't talk about. You want to talk about it every opportunity you get, but I, I don't talk about it much because it seems gratuitous because the result was just so obscene. <laughs> that mm -hmm. any mention of yeah, it seems yeah, to be yeah. hyperbole exaggeration. Yes, yes. But for those people who don't know, we should talk about it. So yes. let's set up sort of what the environment was in uranium at that time, how the company started and ultimately what was the result of that. Okay. Thanks, Albert. So what, I'll go a little bit back before I got my sort of uranium sort of training, if you like, uh, with a German company that I uh, uh, worked for for 15 years. And I got a great grounding in the whole sort of uranium nuclear space uh, and, and I worked out of the Australian operation and became general manager of that. So this group pulled out of, uh, out of, out of Australia and in fact um, Uranerts Canada found Key Lake. Key Lake was the instigator to form Cameco and uh, and this sort of new modern uh, uranium sort of play happened. So I then, uh, well, abandoned the uh, the uranium side. I then started consulting. I bought a database from from Uranerds because they weren't worth anything, and then I started. I founded Paladin, and we were looking for a bit of gold, and then all of a sudden I got. After three, four years, I said to my board, "Look, we've got to go back for the uranium. There is a kicker in this that you can't believe. This was in '96, and so we worked hard, and uh, and uh, it was the Kyoto sort of time when uh, then you know sort of emissions and greenhouse were sort of ta talked about. There was a bit of a kick in uranium." And I started getting a, a, the Australian sort of assets cheaply, and uh, and in '98 I I bought uh, an asset in Africa, and then I teamed up with with Rick Rule in 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 '98 '99. He sort of backed me a little bit. It was nobody wanted to talk to us, and my play it was contrarian was based on a belief that demand would come up. China hadn't yet started building uh, reactors. Um, the, uh, the swallow at that time was a new reactor. A new, you know, after the post Chernobyl period where nothing had been built for 15 years. So I could get assets really cheaply. And the whole thing is, was to get pounds in the ground and, uh, and develop a, a multi-project platform which gave optionality for production and uh, although we hadn't uh, mined anything before we had a firm philosophy that we would, uh, we would find the project and mine them. And so in 2003 uh, uh, the price started to go up uh, Rick's sort of support was was validated and vindicated, and we then uh, uh, built our Langer Heinrich operation in 2005, and demand did kick in, and from that, Paladin went from the you know the two two cent stock to ten dollars, and uh, as I say, there is nothing like it, um, and I agree, it's a hyperbole that sounds. It sounds strange to talk about, but the mathematics uh, uh, say it. But it shows what happens when you, you, you do a true contrarian play, but it's not only contrarian, it's to build a platform appropriate for what you visualise and then that kicks in. So coming to today, 
What is the difference? The difference is that demand, nobody argues about that anymore. This is going to go on and China and India and the Middle East and, and, and rebuilds, they're all going to be more reactors are coming in and, and it's essentially a demand like it was pre-Fukushima. So what the big difference now is, and what, uh, and as I as I mentioned, the biggest damage from Fukushima has not been demand. It it is that it has actually destroyed a supply sector. The uh, uh, the continued low uranium price has has forced companies to exit. Uh, left. Uh, uh, Rio is pulling out after being in the in the uranium business since 1950s. These are big fundamental structural problems. Paladin, the company I founded, is now who knows where it will end, but it is not anything like it was in terms of a recognised multi-project, sort of multi-platform, multi-project global company. So now becomes what's missing now is a company that can participate in growth in production capacity. So we've got to get projects consolidate where, uh, where sector consolidates. <coughs> we are looking for production in, in, in multiples of two to three million pounds and it's for the larger capacity and we think that we will not only develop mines at extremely high profit because of where I see uranium price goes but will become a extraordinary attractive group for others that will want to align with us or participate with us yes. because uh, if I could interrupt yep. just for a second mm -hmm. since I had the founder of Paladin I can talk about two cents to ten dollars a little bit longer um, it wasn't a straight line there were some difficult times there absolutely check times yes um, did the whole thing take a lot longer to play out than you yes, thought? Yes, back then? yes, yes. So, so, so basically, well, uh, let's take the period uh, when when Rick uh, first uh, came in, and uh, and and uh, yeah, we both thought it would sort of start up. Uh, he bought at ten cents. It went down to one, um, and then uh, and then he supported it at one. So he filled up with all this sort of <laughs> one cent stock, and um, and then. When uh, uh, other people started to come in, institutions started to come in, seeing that we were legitimate, we were genuine, we weren't dressing the bride to sell her, we were actually going to make a marriage between deposit and the company and build mines, and the price just, you know, the uh, Paladin share price just went, you know, in 2003, with still three cents. In 2004, to five, it was sort of six, eight, eight, ten dollars, and uh, and the good thing about it was we went into production, we went and building, and the price settled out to about six dollars eighty, which was not too bad, you know, after the expectations of a of a mine, and we 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 consolidated around that price, our share our market cap at about two point five billion, and uh, and we're building uh, projects. If Fukushima hadn't happened. We would have, you know, just continued on and and, and made a, a, you know, another another sort of a, a long-term player in the business. As it happened, Fukushima caused this uh, disruption, and now we're coming back and playing out that part where supply is the issue and not demand. Okay, one of the selling points here, Deep Yellow, um, is the team that you yes. assembled. Yes. Yeah. Uh, these are. This is a team that uh, had experience from your first yes. go at it. What's special about this particular team? Well, the firstly a knowledge about uranium. It's it's a it's a it's a specialty game, and uh, and and what what is a specialty game about it? Yes, the geology is geology, and the types of deposits are, are uh, you know be it copper, be it nickel, they're all in the same uh, way. But what, what is really involved is the stakeholders that are around you. So you not need just technical uh, geolog geologists. What we, do need, what we did need was also engineers because no mines had been built for 20 years. And, and what happened was all those existing plants were like time machines 
re you know, they were just out there old fashioned, they weren't modernised because prices were low and, and we had to then innovate and, and, uh, and make projects with different approach and as I said we became trendsetters in processing and development and some of those were patented. So and I always say that uranium is like the airline industry and the other mine, mining other commodities are like a trucking industry. What I mean by that is the an airline industry has has two issues. The phobia of altitude that people may have and claustrophobia. So a company and they have to promote safety so confidence in the, in the, in the whole system becomes very important. In uranium it's exactly the same in the nuclear business. You've got to really know your stakeholders are concerned. They have, they have perceptions about uh, all of the sort of uh, issues of radioactivity, of, of uh, you know, how you manage the environment. And the way you do that is that you've got to know your, you've got to know your product. You've got to be able to tell your, your educate your stakeholders that you're not there as a two a two year old expert in, in the Iranian business, and you bring in people with the confidence and the knowledge you have, and that's why it is like an airline industry. Your 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 whole crew as you're travelling in that aircraft is by the the competence and the branding of the pilot and how he uh, you know sort of transmit when you're in a bit of trouble. The same as, as uranium. You just have one little spill. It's, f it's first, first page problem. You have one little spill out of a, a gold mine or a, it it's not even reportable. So it's not the size of the issue that it's with uranium. And, and you've got to be able to deal with those, uh, those aspects and where your stakeholders, be they government, be they community, be they the landowners that, that, that are there, be it all of the regulatory groups, they have to have confidence that you're a serious player, that you match it with the big boys and that, that uh, you can be trusted with, uh, with uh, working in that, in that it's industry. It's an interesting uh, comparison or analogy you made. Yeah. I just remember hearing the CEO of Delta Airlines in yeah. an interview talking about how he has this massive organization, yeah. yet each plane goes into the air with four, six, eight Absolutely. person crew. Yes, yes. And they are solely responsible yeah. Yeah. Mm. for uh, yeah. the safe travel yeah. of those yeah. passengers yes. and all of yeah. the training yes. Yes. Uh, has to be yeah. spot yeah. on. Yeah. Um, one of the things uh, in the presentation that stood out to me is um, what a quintessential entrepreneur you seem to be. Looking, you sort of made a joke, look at me, I'm looking 30, 40 years mm, out. Yeah. It seems like you really are looking yes. multiple yeah. decades out. Um, talk about the platform you're trying to build and how that is going to pay off in the long run. Right. So what I need to do and what I need to set up in the next three to four years is uh, to put out uh, a project pipeline that has development optionality production output optionality and flexibility but it 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 has projects that can be uh, conceivably developed out to 2035 so people are not just looking at at you with your single project and then to say well you know after they've mined this out they got to go through another risk phase of acquiring another project and these are rare things to do. I know very many gold projects that they're short-term resources, they've lucked out maybe on the first one, they make a lot of money, but then they go the risk factor of repeating that. So you've got to develop your pipeline while prices are cheap. And, and what does happen then is a utility that looks at you as a multi-mine producer or with projects that are available for the future, they can then see production coming out of your company over a 20 year period, right. 30 year period, and then you're matching it with the sort of the chemicals and, uh, and that's, they've got the production pipeline, you know, they've got various projects, some are sort of laying there, some are, uh, 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 but they're, they're part of the package that that company represents in terms of how it can manage future production and the certainty that the utility has that that company will develop and deliver 
on its on its commitments. Another point you made was that um, this company has no Chinese equity, yes. has no private equity. Yes, yes. Uh, talk about what the difference that's going to make. Okay. My big aim is to make an independent multi-project company. Once you're not uh, sort of um, influenced by uh, uh, large shareholders that have their own uh, objectives and strategies that are more to suit their own their own desires and not those of the general shareholder what happens in those situations is your CEO becomes compromised and and they all so the, the, let's say the Chinese who are now the biggest people holding equity in companies because they've got big growth plans and almost all companies have got a Chinese um, uh, sort of influence those that haven't become even more valuable because they're the ones that can look at consolidation, can take opportunity, the, the, they don't have to sort of, uh, uh, some things you may do uh, while you've got a big uh, sort of, let's say a Chinese shareholder, is that it's actually against what they're trying to do, what they want. And, and I think that limits then uh, the CEO in his, in his ability to develop a broad-based company that then is attractive to the Koreans, to the Japanese, to the Middle East, uh, uh, you know, the Emirates, to, to the, the French. And, and, and I think by exclusion you make a company valuable and it's needed in the global supply industry. Right, and uh, so that's a sort of the national interest yes. uh, swaying, swaying the management of the company. But what about private equity? What, and now, pri well this, this is a good point. So what happened post, uh, post um, Fukushima? After three years, private equity made the punt that this was the bottom. So they ploughed in equity into, into companies that they thought were, was at the bottom. And, uh, and three years later, they've been forced to put more money because capital has been hard to raise. That capital has proved very, very expensive to the existing shareholders because it's been expensive. And, and a lot of the private equity groups then take uh, management board decisions to, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to protect their, their investment. And what happens here now is after you get a price downturn, like anything, people have to take a haircut. It's the owners that have to take the haircut. When I joined Deep Yellow, there's a good lot of great shareholders out there. There were 2.57 billion shares. And the haircut was consolidating 20 to 1. The same applies that if, if these companies are to be redeemed, they, those original shareholders have to take the haircut to allow the company a new base to then, as I say, they've got to get themselves then at the beginning of the runway, not toward the end where they're still static and they're going to try and take off in the last hundred metres of, of, of runway that's left for them in terms of their sort of capital and their shareholders. So you're saying so they're compromised. Yes, yes. I think the um, the the yes, there is. It's a uh, they'll just wait it out. They can they can they can take time. Because they'll say, "All right, well, I believe it's uh, you know that we've got uh, you know five years. The company may remain static to that deposit. There's no other consolidation ideas. Right. So you're not building the platform. So you're not building the platform. Yeah. So they become restrictive to that uh, to that issue. So eventually, that little deposit will go. But all those shareholders that are there are wasted because they're sort of diluted so far out of the system." And they're not participating in it. That uh, it's 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 a, a by default okay. uh, conquering of the of. of uh Last question for you, because I'm keeping you late mm -hmm. here. Um, you were actually in retirement. You yes. came out of retirement yes. uh, to to run this yeah. company a couple of years ago. Um, after Paladin Energy, yeah. uh, what are your expectations? Are you kind of like Michael Jordan coming out of retirement? I mean, it's it's what 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 are your own expectations? Okay, so. So I, I come from a farming background, and, um, and which I'll come back just in a moment. So when I, when I retired, I had uh, virtually 
20, 30 years of continual application to my job. I've got a lovely wife and she was my sort of back office, doing everything, family, I've got a farm and a son now has grown up who, who sort of took over looking after things. So when I went into this retirement, when I by mutual consent left uh, uh, Paladin, I had a great time sort of catching up with, with life, finding out where the reticulation in my garden was, the farm, just family. And after six months, I'm, I, I find my personal expression through work, through achievement and through a dream. I can't do it in golf, I can't do it in, 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 in fishing, uh, I can just, just do so much and, the, and I, I absolutely uh, uh, I said to my wife, look I'm, I'm going to have another go here because I'm looking at things now out way beyond my sort of use by date but I know I can set I can set things up and uh, and I'm giving myself sort of four or five years of v active active work and then I'll have a wise head roll in the in the company I'm not trying to restrict it with new blood coming in and and I and I really know uh, how I can act as a as a as a mentor and as a as a as a, as a leader so I'm refreshed I've got things I, I really need to do, my, my, my staff are supporting, they, they're actually excited that there's another sort of adventure on the way, and um, yes. What did you learn from Paladin that you're rolling into this next part? Right, so what I did learn is uh, be very wary of debt. Even though your model might be great, there are outside influences like a Fukushima, like, uh, uh, and where it wasn't that Fukushima happened. It was that I really had 12 months that I could have done things and reacted and fixed that. And and uh, and I and I believe that uh, going going forward, I'll be you know I'll be yes I'll be aggressive. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, my sort of risk uh, sort of uh, uh, factor is, is 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 strong. But what I'll do is I'll make it that I don't I don't sort of lose that initiative and to, to control that debt, put it into in a control base. And that that mistake is what I uh, you know will come away and be very careful for. Very good. Mm. Uh, we'll conclude here. Yeah. Uh, Salbert Liu with John Borshop, Managing Director and CEO of Deep Yellow. Uh, very much enjoyed this yeah. conversation. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. Thank and, you. And best of luck. Thank you. Yeah.